Hi, and welcome back. So in the first part, we went over the new and novel seats, what the FAA did to start addressing those, and what test dummies we anticipated using in this research. Um, for part two, I want to go into the development of the new injury criteria, some of the PMHS testing, and that actually stands for post-mortem human surrogate, the injury criteria that were developed, kind of the wrap up of the projects, and then I'll get into some of the policies and the testing requirements. So now that we have the test dummies that we wanna use and we know what kind of structure around the occupant we anticipate, this is where we come up with new injury criteria. And the way that we do that is we test a PMHS and an ATD in the same situation, in the same circumstances, at the same velocities and accelerations, and we compare the loading and the injuries that we see in the PMHS against the loading that we see in the test dummy. We use various restraints in both of these, and we did a range of accelerations to try to figure out, we know that there might be an injury here, but where does that injury start? And that's why you'll see that it's not always at the full certification pulse that we run these tests. We actually do it a little bit lower at times. And we use the same configurations that we used that were determined during the CAMI testing in Oklahoma City. So for the side-facing PMHS, this is one of, the, um, one of the tests that were run and each red mark, so there are two slashes on the spine and there's multiple red dots on the ribs as well as a break in the clavicle and in the leg, uh, we had a mid femur, uh, mid shaft fracture and each one of those represents some type of bony injury that occurred during the testing. So that was just one injury that we saw in one of the tests. But for the side facing, we broke it into two phases. And in phase one, where we were doing the full acceleration, we saw very serious neck injuries. In the common side facing seat configurations under part 25, which is your transport category, crash pulse. Additional injuries that we expect are rib fractures due to the belt and direct loading, femur and hip fractures due to leg flail, and carotid intimal tear due to shoulder belt loading. And that means that the belt was loading so hard on the neck that it actually did damage to the carotid artery. And some of the head angular, angular acceleration levels actually suggested up to an hour of unconsciousness which is not okay because occupants need to be able to egress an aircraft after a crash event. Phase two used full body and isolated head and neck specimens. And what we found is the maximum lateral bending moment produced in the PMHS was 651 inch pounds and the corresponding ATD, so ES2 lateral bending recorded was um, 1,018 inch pounds. And at that level, there were no detectable spinal injuries produced. So like I said, we're not just looking for what type of injuries, but we're looking at, at what level and what loading do those injuries no longer, no longer appear and where's that threshold? So we know where to, where to start protecting people at. For the oblique PMHS results, here's another one. This is actually three specimens represented by these graphics. You can see we had several spinal injuries numerous rib injuries, and that was at the 100% pulse. So then when we ran it again at the 60%, so 60% of the same energy that goes into the certification pulse is what we ran that one at, there were no injuries detected. So that lets us know, kind of starts parsing down where the onset of injuries might be. Some of the injuries produced during the PMHS test are some of the same ones we anticipated based on the initial tests at CAMI. So spine injuries, rib fractures, and then we had a few other injuries that occurred that, that weren't predicted. And so MCW, can, uh, the Medical College of Wisconsin, MCW, conducted matched pair testing with the FA Hybrid 3. And in particular, it was lumbar tension that we saw that was an issue. We had a, a spinal transection at the lumbar level that we had anticipated. And the ATD test corresponding to the non-injury PMHS case produced 5.2 kilonewtons, which is 1,200 pounds approximately of tension in the spine. 
And the testing done both at MCW and KIMI showed that a poorly restrained occupant in an obliquely oriented seat is at a fairly high risk of a fatal injury. And so the test configurations we tested are likely the extreme worst case. There wasn't any structure in front of them to absorb energy. We didn't have any airbags involved. So there's other cases that are going to be less injurious. Um, and the results indicated that our current policy of really limiting flail in both the side and the oblique facing seats is warranted. Now that we know what kind of injuries and what our thresholds are, we're going to use the ES2RE injury criteria to help protect the occupants. So first and foremost, we're going to continue with a HIC limit of 1,000, which is exactly what we have in the forward-facing criteria. We're going to use the upper torso strap load limit of 1,750 pounds, which is also something that is used in the forward-facing criteria. But now we're going to have some upper neck limits. So the amount of tension that's allowed inside of the upper neck load is 405 pounds. Any compression also has to be less than 405 pounds. And the torque or the rotation in the neck needs to be less than that 1,018 inch pounds that we saw as that onset of injury. And the shear in the neck needs to remain below 186 pounds. For the ribs, we'll use the upper, middle, and lower rib deflection. Each needs to be less than 1.73 inches. The sum of the abdominal forces, so it will separate them all out, out by front, middle, and rear. You add them together, and that needs to remain less than 562 pounds. The pubic synthesis force is less than 1,350 pounds. We put in a lower leg flail limit of 35 degrees, and I have a picture on the next slide so that you kind of understand what I mean there. And then the restraints need to main, uh, remain on the ITD throughout the event. Um, and that's just to make sure that the, the restraints stay where they're supposed to, and they're not getting up into the abdomen where they're not supposed to on the initial, um, during the initial event. And then uh, the occupant support criteria that simply means that the pelvis needs to be the load bearing portion of the bottom of the pelvis, shall not translate beyond the edge of the supporting structure. The head and neck shall not translate beyond the plane of the seat back supporting structure. And any lateral flexion of the torso must not exceed 40 degrees from the normal upright position during the impact. And no occupant to occupant contact. However, during rebound, it's allowed. So the lower leg rotation criteria, here is a picture. The, there is a lack of biofidelity in the ES2RE hip. And that means that even low energy can still create a high rotation during rebound. So we have a maximum femur rotation angle limit um, of 35 degrees. And you can see that one of the issues is trying to capture that on video to quantify it, um, in this instance, we used team emotion tracking software to come up with 74 degrees as the approximate rotation in that leg. But you can also install an angular rate sensor into the upper thigh bone and get that a bit more precise, especially if part of the leg is obscured during the event. And in this instance, the ARS gave us a value of 72 degrees. So during the rebound, because of how the, the uh, leg rebounds up, um, that limit may not be quite as appropriate during that. Um, and that's true for both the full 16G test and any threshold test. The restraints having to stay on the occupant during the impact and rebound, but some of the belt contact forces are not likely to cause serious injuries if the pelvic restraint slides off the pelvis during the rebound phase of the impact, not the initial phase, the rebound, if the tension in that strap remains less than 250 pounds, which means you're going to have to make sure that you capture the loads that you get in that belt. Otherwise, you cannot prove if that restraint tension stayed less than that, if the restraint ended up on the abdomen. So here's a video of a side-facing test conducted at CAMI.
You can see that while the left leg was captured by the structure, the right leg was allowed to flail up further than it should have. And then there was a bit of rebound there where the test dummy slid down just a little bit. So we have this new criteria and the question is, can existing cases pass this new criteria? So in the center there, that is a middle of the couch. So there's no supporting structure next to the test dummy, but with an inflatable bag to then support the head and neck. And you can see in this instance, he passed um, because of passed all of the new criteria. On the middle one there, you have a test dummy up against a rigid wall. So he supported throughout the entire event. Again, passing all of the criteria, you know, we didn't have to worry about rib deflection or pubic synthesis um, forces exceeding what they're supposed to. Now on that last one on the far right on your slide, you can see we supported the head and neck and passed those criteria. However, the leg, there was nothing to stop it. And because of just the basic kinematics, this one would have failed the leg injury criteria. So in this instance, it would need some type of a support in order to protect the legs and then pass the leg criteria. For the oblique seat, you must use the FAA Hybrid 3. We allow a hick of a thousand, or if you have an airbag or you can do HIC 15, but it has to be less than 700. We were able to use the neck um, NIJ, so the neck injury criteria, and it has a, you can see right below that bullet, it's actually got the equation for it, and it's a value of less than one. And it's all based on whether or not you're in compression and tension, and you use the appropriate numbers and values uh, to get your ins by J. The peak upper neck force must be less than 937 foot pounds in tension and 899 pounds in compression. No head rotation about the vertical axis past 105 degrees and no concentrated loading. So this is a Another instance, much like the lower leg flail in the side facing, you can use the video to try to estimate the neck twist, but it's very difficult, especially in an oblique seat where you're now going to have to try to maintain and figure out what the neck angle is with respect to the upper, upper torso. So if you've got monuments or other things in place, it's going to make it very hard. Um, so in this case, on that picture at the top right, we use Tima again to try to do a video estimate. And we got about 96 degrees. But if you put an angular rate sensor in, that's going to give you a more precise number. And then if your view is obscured or you lose the ability to get that relative motion, you can use the angular rate sensor information. And we got an approximate uh, value of 91 degrees when we did that. For the spine, we need to maintain a lumbar tension. So how much it's being pulled of less than 1,200 pounds and no concentrated loading between the pelvis and the shoulders during rebound. So if during rebound, like in this picture, your test dummy ends up being pulled backwards just because of the nature of the structure, usually if there's something behind that may impact the spine that the test dummy may hit, um, if there be acceleration, anything exceeding 20 Gs must be less than three milliseconds as measured by the thoracic instrumentation. And that's because we want to make sure that on rebound, we're not going to break the spine because it impacts potentially the shroud around it. So some type of structure or pod structure. Um, we want to make sure that that's protected. And then no interaction with the armrest or other seat components in any manner that's different than would be expected in a forward-facing seat installation. Very similar to the, the side-facing, any port of the load-bearing portion of the test dummy must not translate beyond the ends of the bottom seat cushion and supporting structure. You must, you, just, you have to support them through the entire event. And then any leg axial rotation must be limited to 35 degrees in either direction from the nominal seated position. And again, this is one where, because there's so much structure around you potentially, or around the test dummy, 
it's easier to use instrumentation to get this angle than to try to do it from photometric analysis. So this was a test that we ran for the impact class in 2016. And you can see that the airbag fired off to the left, the test dummy impacted the structure in front of him and the head rotated as he rolled off and then rebounded backwards. So a whole bunch of things going on there that you'd have to then assess. Using this new tension criteria, we took a look at with and without a shoulder belt in all of our different configurations. Given that the um, tension limit is 1,200 pounds, you can see that if you had no shoulder belt, you exceed it in every single situation. So if you allow the, the torso to flail forward, you're going to fail the criteria. Um, but if we added a shoulder belt, you see that there's actually compression that we see in the spine. It makes sense. As the test dummy rotates forward, the shoulder belt keeps him from flailing, and that load just goes into the lower spine. But with our limit of 1,500 pounds, so that's our vertical injury criteria, you're still well below that even with the compression loads generated. So to kind of wrap it all up, oblique and side-facing seats are a novel design, not addressed in the current standards. The current standards are written for purely forward-facing seats. And there's potential serious injuries, uh, injury risk due to neck tension and bending, rib deflection, leg rotation. And new policies apply the latest research findings to ensure that we continue that equivalent level of safety. And new procedures require different injury evaluation methods and a different test dummy. You can't always use the standard forward facing if you're crashing sideways. Current policies, um, as of May 2021, there is the technical criteria for approving side-facing seats. It was published in 2012. The SAE has 8049-1B, and that's the performance standards for side-facing passenger seats. And that one is applicable to rotorcraft, transport aircraft, and general aviation aircraft. And that was from 2016. Then we have for oblique, a technical criteria for approving oblique seats, and that's from 2018. This is only for seats 18 to 45 degrees with respect to aircraft centerline. So it does not apply past 45 degrees. Um, you would have to work with, with your, your certification office if you wanted to install something at, let's say, 60 degrees or something different. And then the SAE has the performance standards for oblique passenger seats. But that one's limited for 18 degrees to 30 degrees with respect to aircraft centerline. And the oblique research is still ongoing. And as new data becomes available, the policies may change. Testing requirements for these seats. For the vertical test, there's no change. You still have the same lumbar injury criteria. You have the same structural criteria. For the longitudinal structure, you need to use the ES2RE, the FAA Hybrid 3, or hybrid two test dummies to do your structural test, and any supporting structures need to be deformed with the floor. When you do the injury assessment test, you need to use the ES2RE for side facing and FAA hybrid three for oblique testing. And all of the references, all of the testing, um, all of the reports that went into the research that then the policy is based on, are on this slide as a part of the reference sources. And so you can go pull that up and read more in depth if you're interested as to how we came up with some of the criteria. All right, thank you, Amanda, for a very engaging and informative presentation. I um, hope everyone has enjoyed it as much as I have. Um, this, as I said, this is a lecture series that's a companion to the Dynamic Impact Test Procedures training. And so stay tuned for additional content and videos, webinars in the near future. Thank you and have a good day.